Okay, it looks like uh, looks like people are in, so we will uh, get started. Maybe I'll try it one more time. Get started. It starts doing it all. Like I said, I'll shut it off. Anyway, uh, hello and welcome everyone to this webinar, which is a joint effort by Lean Frontiers and AME, the Association for Manufacturing Excellence. And there I go again, so I'll shut myself off. Um, I'm Jim Hunsinger, president of Lean Frontiers, and I'm here with Cher Cheryl Jekyll, CEO of the Lean Leadership Center. Today, we will give you an overview discussion on how the skills of coaching, TWI, training within industries, and Toyota Kata give an organization the foundational practices, behaviors really, uh, which build a culture of continuous daily improvement, and actually even more. Um, this is because these skills are the basis for scientific uh, thinking behaviors and principles or, and practices which uh, underpins skills throughout an organization. So with that, let me welcome Cheryl. And as I mentioned, Cheryl is the CEO of the Lean Leadership Center, where they work with uh, the leadership of people-centric companies to increase the capability of their people to tr help transform their workplace by providing long-term approach that supports an optimized work team. Also, Cheryl is a longtime friend and colleague and has keynoted and presented at many of our summits over the years. And I also always like to say that Cheryl wrote the book on Lean HR because she literally wrote the first book on Lean HR and has published a number of books and articles around the uh, subject you know, since. Um, she has su significant experience from both sides. That is a practitioner in the roles of an HR executive and also as a consultant helping guide executives of many companies. So I love working with Cheryl and have um, over many years. Um, she's gonna kick off our discussion. So with that, Cheryl, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Jim. I've enjoyed all our escapades over the last several years since I first got into this area of work. Um, today, I'm going to be, uh, this webinar is going to be covering the topic of coaching, which had been part of um, my work in continuous improvement um, from pretty much, I think, the very beginning. There was certainly a time when it became clear that the style of leaders that we would need in, you know, lean or continuous improvement would need to be more of a coaching style. The issue kept being um, is that it was just much easier said than done. There were years where it was like we were just trying to get clear. What does it mean to coach? Does it mean to be on the floor more? Does it mean to ask more questions? Um, a lot of, you know, in the last 10 years, it had to do with maybe kata coaching or very specific if you were doing problem solving or if you were coming through the floor and saw people struggling with an issue, how would you be more of a coach rather than tell them what to do? Somewhere about, it's a little over five years ago, I happened to be working for the state of Illinois, actually at the time, doing lean work, and they were building out supervisory training, like basically that very traditional supervisory, just how do you basically lead people at all? And I was watching them do it, and it wasn't going very well, and I uh, was invited with my HR background to step out of the lean work and help with that. And so we built a new leadership uh, a, a basic, you know, leadership development program that was based on coaching. It was like this whole thing about how do you coach every day, all day, instead of just about continuous improvement. Uh, what I'm going to be sharing with you today is a bit of what I've learned. What surprised me the most is when it worked. Um, I'm always like, you know, I built a lot of leadership trainings and a lot of them, like they have a marginal impact for a day or two or a week or a month. A lot of it goes away as fast as you do it. And I'm going to share with you what we've learned since then. It was successful enough. I've spent the last five years doing mostly this, developing it, learning, experimenting, trying things. And it continues to show some of, I think, what's needed to build this anywhere. It's definitely not something that I've done that's so magical. I want to share with you what I think are just transferable learnings. So... What we've uncovered were six coaching habits that need to be built up when you're shifting from leaders who are generally more traditional to certainly more coaching-like on a day-to-day -day basis. My original premise was that if we had people coach just for continuous improvement, the skills weren't strong enough to be in place. So I wanted, when we built this basic leadership training to make it clear, it's kind of a way to lead every day, all day. So one of the big learnings has been on the topic of be clear, which I would not have guessed was such a major issue. This has to do with many of you might be aware of needing to make sure behaviors are clear. Like um, a lot of times we use language like take ownership or be accountable or be responsible, but people don't know what we mean when we use those words. 
And so there's a lot of, or we want to, you know, improve quality, but I may not be clear exactly what do I mean, exactly what behaviors need to change, and I'm not clear as a leader maybe what I need to do. So we keep uncovering a lot of need to build habits around clarity, clear language, clarity in your vision, clear how we communicate. Um, the teach them to fish, you might guess, is just what it sounds like. This has to do with a lot of the learnings around how much of the time do leaders find themselves um, actually fishing, doing the feeding their teams instead of teaching them to fish. So this has been a way that we've heard several people refer to it. So it's really getting clear how much of the time are we teaching them to fish rather than feeding them. Um, taking responsibility. Uh, that is a habit around whatever's going on. As a leader, take responsibility that more often than not, it is still from one of the leadership responsibilities that need to be carried out. One of the things we talk about is whose responsibility is it to make sure expectations are set, that training's been provided, that regular coaching and feedback's been provided, that we're recognizing the right behaviors, those kinds of things. And really until those are exhausted, we can't tell if we have people issues. So helping leaders become more clear, how do you take more responsibility that whatever your outcomes are probably coming from your behaviors? The good news of that is you can make the changes to get where you wanna go. The let go habit um, is just what it sounds like. It's really um, from over years of watching leaders become better coaches, it becomes more of a habit to be, I call it being comfortable with being uncomfortable. Being aware that when you have that sense that, man, I, I'm not controlling something, they're doing something their own way, that you're right where you need to be. That's you're right where you, you feel like, you know, they're really not going to probably break anything and you're, you're not on unsafe territory. You're just letting go of the control. And so realizing a lot of times that should be the feeling is you're kind of uncomfortable. Um, we talk about uh, motivating more. And so um, being clear, when do we still offer help or do things for our teams, still absorb the problems rather than help develop them and motivate them to be able to take more on, do more, solve more problems. So shifting from I'm spending more time motivating and less time and developing and less time doing for people and really getting clear how much of the time we're doing things we don't have to be doing for people. And the last, uh, reinforce equality, um, people of different ways they might refer to this, is the idea around, um, a lot of times I, I've seen over the years, we really basically teach people to look up, uh, meaning who, who do I report to? How do they feel about me? What do they want? And so people, they don't know as much what they think. They're less independent. So all the coaching habits build independence. And to do that, we, we're looking to move away from a sense of hierarchy that everything is a matter of what does my boss think or what does the senior leaders think. That has people looking up. And so what we've learned is helping leaders reinforce an environment that if we're all responsible adults working to get an outcome, then it's not so much who's on top of who or who's higher than who. And so leaders can work towards reinforcing a sense of equality and literally stop training people to look up. What I've seen is some of the most productive teams I've ever seen, especially from building these habits, are clear that they're literally training people not to look up, um, meaning to seeing their leader as an authority figure rather than the customer, so to speak. So those are some of the habits that we've uncovered in the work as we've helped people just build this everyday, all day coaching habit. Um, from here, what we found, which was probably much almost more important, was what it takes to sustain the habits. So all of these things, it became clear. I don't know if many of you have ever read the book, The Coaching Habit. The reason why I'm so fond of that book, it makes it clear coaching is something, it's, it's got to be an everyday, all day behavior until it's your go-to behavior compared to, yes, I could do it today, or I could do it for five minutes, or I, you know, I've practiced it a few times. Here was when I mentioned it worked and no one was more surprised than me that that was true, is these are what were the common elements. Uh, one, the first thing I think that created the win was they did it as a community. Um, one of the things I'd ask you to be thinking about in your own workplaces, are your leaders sharing their challenges, their vulnerabilities 
to let go. All those habits I just mentioned are hard. Um, I haven't seen any group of leaders say that's a, you know, it's no problem. I can do it. Where I am seen is when they do it together and they share the challenge and the struggle of that, they do much better. Um, that does not come from the training. That does not come from consulting. That just comes from when leaders are banded together in a common sense of where they're trying to get to as in their leadership styles, um, you know, a lot of things are possible. So that was really that first shift that I was just, I hadn't planned on seeing it. Um, there's certainly a need to get clear that you're shifting what feels good to you as a leader. There's a lot of good feelings of when you feel needed, when you feel people depend upon you, when you feel like you solve their problems, you're having to trade out those good feelings for helping people be more independent, developing people to do work without any of your involvement. So getting clear of how things need to shift, um, that you will get good feelings, they'll just be from different things. Um, lots of practice, uh, whatever that might look like. I've come to see that people think of leadership like you could somehow get through leadership development or training and get somewhere and then not need to practice. I compare this to like, by the way, I'm not a sports person like baseball, uh, or football or, or any sport, athletes need to practice and do drills to stay good at something. Leadership has a lot of skill in it, especially a coaching style of leadership. So I think setting things up to practice, not this year, not just next year, but like regular leadership practice to keep those skills and capabilities and mindsets in place. And the last but not least is to be on your own side I've seen a lot of people, I realize when they're shifting their behaviors, they become kind of self-critical. And I think that leads them to feeling like I'm not learning it. I'm not doing well enough. I think all that negative self-talk doesn't help people coach. Uh, one of the things about coaches, they need to be supportive and affirming of their teams. It's hard to do that if you're not feeling affirmed yourself or feeling like, you know, I'm doing okay and they're doing okay. We're all working at this. So becoming more aware whether or not your way of thinking about how you're leading is positive or does it tend to be like, I'm not, you know, like a lot of negative, like I'm not doing it well enough. So one of the things we've seen, again, I'm not proposing this. I'm saying I've seen it real time. When the leaders seem to get more gentle with themselves, more supportive, they again, they propel forward. It helps them learn. They become more willing to take a try or keep at it, more supportive of themselves making mistakes along the way. Um, so the last thing I just want to talk about um, briefly is I've come to think of this as um, like, what's, what's, what does all this come to? When I first saw the most independent workforce I'd ever met, I said, I feel like I'm in the land of Oz. Like, why the land of Oz? It was like, because it's somewhere amazing, except nobody's ever seen it before. So I would ask everyone to think about if you were to really be as successful as you could be in creating that highly engaged culture from, coach, from leaders that really coach, what would it look like? What would be your results? What would be true? Um, what kinds of problems would go away? Um, what kind of, you know, high morale could you ever attain? So this to me is the cue to let us consider, keep imagining more and also asking ourselves, if we were successful, what would be true? I find a lot of times we're busy trying to be more engaged, but we're not necessarily um, actually doing it. Um, so I just, I think it's a good thing to think about. Let your imagination really imagine something you haven't seen before. So with that, I'm going to be turning this over to Jim. Uh, Jim, I don't know if you had any questions for me before we switch over to yours. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, yeah. A couple bounced in. Uh, one is, um, is, you know, maybe how, or maybe where do you recommend an organization, organization maybe starts from a, from a coaching standpoint? Is it like a good entry point? Yeah. Here it is, and I love it because when I first uncovered, I'm like, man, that's simple. Asking open-ended questions. So even if in a group you just say, what's the difference between closed-ended and open-ended? And that open-ended start generally with what or how. Be careful of why questions. Start just getting more aware when you're asking closed-ended questions compared to open. And just get if every day you asked more open-ended questions, what would be true? Leaders start to see, I would be demonstrating respect. I would spend more time listening. I would learn more information. So that one fundamental habit 
to ask more open-ended questions and then listen is a great place for any team to begin. Um, one thing a lot of our leaders do, they'll make little post-it notes and they'll put open-ended questions like what or how, they'll put it somewhere like on their computers or on their notebooks so they remind themselves to ask more questions. All right, great, thank you. And uh, another one is, um, what, what do you think the biggest or maybe most frequent obstacles are that companies run into in being successful with uh, coaching? With coaching? Um, one, I think they're not sharing that journey. So I think the idea that leaders could do it alone. I keep saying this is a team sport. So I think one is make sure the approach is built that the leaders create leadership community. The second is it's a fairly significant intervention. I, in general, I've always thought it was much too little, um, too short um, training. I mean, even the work I've done, I've come to like, I, I really would never refer to it as training. Training tends to create very short bursts of skills. I think it's coming up with a long-term approach of how you build those skills in. Um, that there's no like one week, one day, read the book and you'll shift your habits. I think it's really coming up with more long-term practice. Um, even the coaching federation, I mean, they build coaches out of practice, practice, practice. So practice. All right, great. One more question and then, and then we, we'll get going. But somebody also asked, uh, what do you do about a leader that can't do this? Um, well, I would be slow to probably say they can't. Um, <laughs> I've certainly seen they may not want to. There's a difference between I can't and I won't. Um, I think that's something every organization has to wrestle with. In general, my my sense, some of those individuals I've met over time um, provide really great value in other ways. Um, I'm a believer that sometimes we need to balance out how leadership roles are structured. Some of the great coaches also spend time doing things that they're not as great at. And some people who are not great coaches have other skills. So I think one option is to always redesign leadership roles um, and not have people coach if it's just not something they're prepared to do and still keep them in leadership roles that are probably maybe have other focuses to them. Um, it's not a cure-all, but it has something I've seen work well. All right, great, thank you, Cheryl. So I guess we'll, we'll switch out and, uh, and maybe- Is this right? Yeah. I don't know if we want to stop sharing and all share, then, then I can, because I kind of got some animation and uh, we'll get going. Okay. Share. There's, there's mine across there. Is my slide up? I don't see it yet. Okay, how about now? I'm still not seeing it. Hmm. Oh, there it is. Okay. There it is. All right. There it is. All right. I guess it's just slow to come up. I mean, I'll leave off, like I said, I just because it was fidgety, I'll, I'll leave off my um, um, video. So anyway, um, so I'll get started here. Um, so just a couple maybe uh, points, I guess, you know, I'd like for folks to take out at least the part I'm doing is uh, one is uh, what habits are. Habits are applying skills without thinking about it. And I think you'll see that as kind of as I go through here. And another one is um, habitual skills are developed through practice. And obviously, Cheryl already kind of talked to that as well, the, the importance of practice. So with those two points, I will kind of roll through stuff here. So first of us off is so um, I'm going to talk about skills. So how do we go about learning these skills? Well, um, from a uh, lean or Toyota-ish standpoint, they do it through learn by doing, which actually is a, a saying that came out of the TWI, the Training with Industry program. So what, what does that mean, learn by doing? Well, the way they saw it or do it is, how do you get the job done and at the same time develop your people? Basically accomplish those two things at the same time. Actually with deliberate intention and deliberate direction. So what they say, they won't necessarily send somebody to training, so you get trained on these skills or things like that. They'll go more of, mm, let's go do a project together. And then um, as, a, as, a, as a 
whoever maybe the person's manager is, ideally, um, supervisor, coach, mentor, whatever however you want to call them, they'll go do a project together. Not where the actual um, supervisor um, does the project, but he's there to, you know, things that uh, Cheryl's talking about, coach, mentor, question the person to help them, guide them th through this. So that's how they go, go about doing it. And to give a couple examples, if any of you have seen the movie, The Karate Kid, um, where the one of the main characters is Mr. Miyagi, what he does is, you know, um, the other character in there, main character, Daniel, wants to learn karate. So what's Mr. Miyagi do? Well, he, he says, well, you're going to wax my car. So he, if you've seen that, the movie, wax on, wax off. So he has uh, Daniel waxing car over and over again. And Daniel is confused, frustrated, and anno annoyed because he doesn't really understand. But what Mr. Miyagi is doing is teaching him these, these fundamental skills that he will in, end up using in karate. And as you go through the movie, basically it's a practice, practice, practice. And as you go through the movie, get towards the end with the, the kind of the climax scene and this karate competition. So these behaviors that he had him, uh, Daniel, annoyingly practicing, all of a sudden those things he can do in that com competition instinctively. So one, he does them instinctively and he does them well. Two, it frees up his mind to think about the more complexities, in this case, of the competition he's in. So that's why that is important. Another example is if you've heard of the coach, John Wooden, or familiar with him, if you're not, uh, John Wooden was an All-American basketball player at Purdue, and he went on to coach uh, NCAA basketball, and he was a coach of the UCLA Bruins. And in the 60s and 70s, he won nine NCAA championships out of 10 years that he actually uh, competed in. So, I mean, what an accomplishment. And people would always ask him, you know, well, how does he do it? What's his magic? And they also called him the Wizard of Westwood. And he hated that question. He also didn't like being call, called the Wizard of Westwood because his answer was, I teach the basics. I teach the basics. He would teach the basics. He would pick one each season. We'll say like uh, free throw shooting. He would go out and study the teams with the best free throw shooting, you know, college teams, talk to the coaches, find out what they, what they do to do that. Then he would take all that information, compile it together and come up with a training plan in a sense, an action plan that they would work with his team on um, free throw shooting or rebounding or whatever it is that it was that year. So that's what he did is all these basic skills he would develop as guys so they could do those skills flawlessly. So one, they didn't have to think about it. And two, um, it freed up their mind to think through the complexities of the game. So this are examples of this learn by doing, come let's do something together with that. The other part of it is, and this diagram's taken from uh, Mike Rother's book, Toyota Kata, is basically how do you tra traverse the unclear territory? So you have a current condition and you have a target condition where you want to get to, but the answer is how do you get there? And typically is you don't really necessarily have a clear path on how to do that. So you got to go through a lot of iterative um, um, experiments, practices, and so forth to get there. And I like to call it trust the process. So I'm going to dive into um, what's inside of that, I guess, um, unclear territory in a sense. Um, so as I build this up, it's going to be a little bit of a busy slide, but I'm going to kind of chunk it out as we go along. But a couple things here is one is a lot of times organizations will ask, do we do standard work or do we do Kaizen? You know, which do we do? Or which should we do or what order? Well, I guess what I'm saying is um, you do both, but really they only exist when they coexist. They're completely codependent on each other and I'll kind of walk through that. And that's using the skills. So we're talking about skills and these basic skills are uh, TWI, um, training within industry. So job instruction, job methods, job relations, and also the Kata skills for Toyota Kata, the improvement Kata and the coaching Kata. And, and uh, all these skills are um, based on the scientific method. So there's scientific thinking built into these skills and as people learn them, which teaches them the skill of scientific behavior, utilizing these skills. This diagram I'm gonna go through is actually one I took from uh, Patrick Graup of the TWI Institute he made, and I kind of adopted it for, for this because it kind of does a good layout of some of these, uh, I guess, components of this. So with that, you know, we'll come to this. So the first part of it here is when you come into, um, a process, and this doesn't have to be manufacturing, this can be any process, administrative and so forth, a lot of times they're fairly unstable. So the first thing you want to do is get your processes so they're 
stable. They're in a stable state, really, in some ways, before you even start making improvements on them, you just want them stable. And you could use these skills, um, you know, job instruction, job relations, uh, the, the, the two different katas to develop a stable process. So you cut your first starting point to get to the starting point is make a stable process. And you could utilize these skills to do that. Um, next, you kind of create a current condition or even go back to the value stream mapping um, terminology, current state, and you want to get some target condition or future state or whatever term you use for that. And in order to do that, you, you run into a series of obstacles. So you've got to work through these obstacles in order to do that. Well, how do you go about doing that? Well, again, the TWI skills and the kind of skills um, are fundamental to being able to do that. So for example, if you run into some type of obstacle, maybe people can't do something. Well, maybe that's uh, the countermeasure is job instruction. Maybe they need to train properly, which is very common. We don't train people very well. Um, or maybe they won't do it. So maybe it's a, a, a people problem. So how do you go about resolving that people problem and, and so on? And even through the course of, on this improvement trajectory up to the targeting condition, you're gonna have a lot of interim in a way, target conditions, current conditions to get to. So you'll go, you know, it says sub improvements, you know, improvement kata, but there'll be a lot of improvements, these iterations you got to go through to make improvements, to get over obstacles and go through the learning process. And again, you use these skills, the TWI skills and the kata skills to do that. But also too with that is as you move up, you make an improvement, you need to make sure you stay up on your upward trajectory. If you look at a, most organizations over the last almost several decades who did a lot of Kaizen and so forth, they're, they're instead of a straight curve or a straight going up like the diagram here, it really kind of arced back down. They usually couldn't sustain those improvements um, very well. So a key with that is putting good standard work in place, which standard work is utilizing job instruction, job methods, improvements, improvement kata to do that. It creates this wedge that keeps you in place. So you create a, a new level of uh, stabilization to keep you in place. Um, so you need to do that until you go through the next iteration of improvements. So we'll dive into that. And basically, like I said, these are, these are the scientific method, you know, plan, do, check, act. So let's dive into that a little bit. Like I said, very brief overview because such a short, short um, time frame here, but you make improvements. So first you need to stabilize, even after you make improvement, job instruction helps to do that, to stabilize other standard work tools. Um, you can certainly use uh, the coaching kata, you know, to question all these, all these skills, all the J programs as they're called, the katas all have questions built into them. So that's where a lot of the questioning comes in on to make sure you do that. Like with the coaching kata, you know, what is the obstacle and what do you, what that's preventing you from reaching the particular target condition? And which one are you addressing now? And what outcome do you expect to get? So it gets you thinking through this. And that's kind of the role of the role of the coach involved in this. And then you make these improvements through job methods, through other just improvement methodology, Kaizen methods, improvement kata, and you get that upward trajectory. Well, then you, in a way, step up to it. But then you, again, you've got to put that standard work wedge in place through job instruction to stabilize, to maintain where you're at. So then you could go through the next iteration. And really, this is traversing that unclear territory um, to do that. And also, too, the job relations, you want an environment where people can do this and feel comfortable and confident in doing it. And that's where job relations comes in. Or you might have a, you know, it's always people in process. You might have a people problem that you need to deal with in an effective manner. Job relations help you with that, a skill to do that as well. So with that, through all this kind of kind of laid over the top, which is important, and like I said, Cheryl talked a lot of this, is the coaching. This, this um, come, you know, let's go work on a project together and I won't do it for you, but I will help coach you, guide you, question, ask you questions to help you think through that. And that's where the co coaching, the mentoring comes in, whether it's with the standard work or whether it's the next iteration of obstacles, whether it's thinking through a current obstacle or even thinking through what is the best next obstacle to go through, that whole coaching aspect. And there you can see a little diagram, I think it was on a previous slide, that I got from John Shook, who worked for Toyota for, for many years, on showing how he does that. They're really helping them up. The people are doing the work of it, but the coach, the guide, the manager is uh, really the one that to guides them through that. And part of that learning process is too, eventually after you get experience, you may start coaching, mentoring someone below you to help them 
through that um, process, teaching them these skills and, and coaching them through that. So that's really, like I said, a very high level view of what this is, but what goes on in that uncleared um, territory. And a lot of people will ask, you know, well, what should people do? Well, a lot of this is as you go through this, and that's why the practicing of this becomes so important, the practice, 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 is what do you do? Well, it depends. And it, what it really depends on, and you'll hear a lot of people, particularly people will say it depends, it depends on circumstances. What do you step in? The circumstances will tell you what you need to do next. But when you have these skills that are habits, you instinctively respond. So you may be doing um, the job instruction in, in, in conjunction with maybe um, the improvement kind of asking those questions. So that's how these things coexist. And the more you people do this as individuals or on teams together, you build up all this experience behind them. So you build up a lot of, um, I call magnitude, this magnitude of experience and also increase your velocity. The more experience people get with it, the quicker they could go through these iterative cycles, ex experimentation. So this is to propel you up that, up that curve without backsliding or without the, the curve up, you know, kind of arcing back down. Um, so with that, what I like to say is really, um, again, not, not anything difficult in, in the skills of what they are, maybe difficulty in you know, committing and dedicating and doing it. And uh, really what this becomes is this treasure trove of uh, skills that allow you to be successful between the skills, between the coaching you know, skills and the practicing. And I like to say uh, one thing, if you're not using TWI and Kata the same in three months, that's a problem because you should be practicing, 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 just like Mr. Miyagi to uh, Daniel, wax on, wax off, just keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it until it becomes instinctive and you, and you do it without thinking, that type of habit. But the other thing is, is uh, if you're using TWI and Kata the same in three years, it's also a problem because in time you should be growing with uh, with these uh, with the use of these. And really, like I said, beyond just um, process, you really should be eventually interpolating these out into large projects and things like that. Uh, one guy I know that um, was at the beginning when TWI came in around 15, 20 years ago, um, he told me a number of years later, he said, when I first started out, I could have never comprehended or have, have used these skills in bigger projects, but he eventually started using them in his engineering projects. And he said, now I can't imagine how I could do these engineering projects without him. That's part of that growth, that learning, not doing the same in three years, but he, but he was still using the underlying, underlying skills. And I think the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll say with this, if any of you have read Steve Spears work, um, he has an article that came out a number of years ago called De Decoding the DNA of Toyota, and also another one, Learning to Lead, and that was actually taken from his PhD dissertation. But here's a quote out of that that really illustrates this and illustrates what Mike Rother observed when he was doing the research. He said, it appears as if people had rules to guide their decisions, yet the rules themselves were never articulated. So that's, hmm, let's go do this together from the, from the, from the mentor, the coach, and through you doing actual work, I'll teach you these skills to do it. So uh, with that, I am, I will go on. And I don't know, I don't know, Cheryl, I don't know if there were any questions. Well, we're, we're out of time. So we can either, oh. tell, there was a few questions or um, it's uh, 34 minutes after. So I'll leave it to you to decide whether we, there was, want me to give you the questions? Uh, sure, maybe just do one or so or something. Um, one uh, person asked the question, when would someone use the GROW model for coaching questions compared to the Kata questions? Um, GROW model is just a general sense of improvement questions. I don't know if you have a thought on that. Yeah, I guess I'm not, I'm not familiar with the, with the GROW model from the, the, from, from the questions themselves. Right. Yeah. So really, I guess the, the Kata questions, or actually even, even the TWI questions, it, 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 they're applicable and really, like I said, it really depends. That's why you wanna practice this because the, in asking the questions, they will become intuitive. You will, you will approach a circumstance, the observation, actually, if you go back to Ono, you know, telling people to go out and watch for hours when they first went out there, again, they were frustrated. They didn't know what to watch for, but over time, they would begin seeing things. So it took time to learn to see. And then they, as they learn these skills, automatically these questions will pop into your head. 
um, to do it. So anytime you run into problems, you want to start asking the question of, you know, what's the current condition? What's the target condition? What experiment can we do to learn? What is our, what is our expectation of the result of the experiment after we run it? Did we meet what our expectation was? Yes or no? And if yes, great. If not, why? So the questions really somewhat in many ways become intuitive. And again, that's part of what the coach does is to help you question you by getting you to think about those questions and learn those questions. I don't know if that answers it specifically, but uh, the questions always are integral to the skills themselves. Yeah, that, that was a good answer. Um, there was also one person that asked the question that when they're working with process owners, that they feel like they relinquish the project over to them, which I sensed was improvement projects, and then they don't own what happens to it from there. And did we have any advice to them about how to handle um, process owners who relinquish the projects over? Well, I guess I'd say this, and, and of course, it's going to depend on the, um, you know, the organization, what you're doing, who's involved, the existing culture, which may be one thing you need to work on. But really, when you do projects, the people, you know, you're doing them with or for um, really need to be an integral part of it. So, for example, you know, in manufacturing and all that, you shouldn't do projects to, you know, the operators or the supervisor of that area. You should be doing it with them. They should be integral, an integral part of this. They should be putting input into this. So if you look at where, you know, particularly the TWI, um, the, well, the JI, JM, and JR originated, they originated for the supervisors um, to, to work on these things, the training or the improvements at that level with their operators out on the shop floor where they didn't need engineers or managers too much to do it. So it's so you really have to involve you know everybody that really should be involved with it to make them part of it. One, they know the process well. Two, how do you get their buy-in? Well, they're part of the the solution, the countermeasure, the input, the questioning. So it's really make those people an integral part of that. Um, and ideally, they they it's not as an I guess an improvement. Maybe you're an improvement person that you're not again not doing it to them, but doing it with them, and and hopefully they learn how to use a lot of these skills. So they can do they can do some a lot of work and improvements without needing an engineer or the improvement um, team. Yep, really good. Thanks, Jim. All Why right. don't we just go through our events? Sure. Close out. Yeah. So um, from a standpoint, I guess of uh, the TWI. Oh, and we have Beth has raised her hand. Beth, is oh, okay. there a question you have? I don't know. There's someone, if you have your hand raised and wanted to chime in on something, let us know. All right, go ahead, Jim. Okay, so we have upcoming um, for like to guess from, I guess from the skill standpoint, next month is the TWI Summit, Nakata Summit. So they'll be uh, March 13th through the 15th at Jekyll Island, Jekyll Island, Georgia. And you can certainly find out more by going to Lean Frontiers website and the website for the summits. Um, they're going to, they're running concurrently. So if you, if you register for one and go to it, you actually have access to the other. So not only access to the content, but access to all the people and the networking. So to go there and really learn, um, learn about these skills, how companies are using these skills for success, how they're, you know, even at times struggling with them, you know, this is the place to go to getting in, integrated with that community. Also too, to learn the skills more specifically, there's a skill point workshops um, skill for for job instruction for Toyota Kata, and also skill point for the coaching Kata, where actually you learn these skills and get the ten hour certification actually on a on a on a working line. So you actually not only get the training on it, but you go out and apply it directly. So it's it's the true learn by doing standpoint. So we hope to see some of you there, and also too we have a number of things that I'll let Cheryl talk about from Association of Manufacturing Excellence. Yes, so we have um, upcoming, we have a lean boot camp and a yellow belt certification. So that's done in two half days. There's um, some information. Jim, is this being sent out so people can click on these links? Yeah, we, we will all, we'll compile the, uh, the video of this and, and also to the NetWay send out the, um, the PowerPoint so people have access to that as well or right. a PDF of it. Great. Um, next, March 3rd, we have a, um, a brief webinar. That one is going to be more of a roundtable discussion. It has some companies sharing their approach to building coaching skills, and it's going to be allow for more interactive discussion with some of the participants. So we'd love to have some of you join us to, to that event. That's coaching the key to continuous improvement. 
We have the Amy Back to Basics Virtual Summit coming up uh, March 8th to the 29th. It's every Wednesday. Um, it's a great summit. It, um, if any of you either for yourselves or have others in your organization that just need to work on learning the basics, it does not assume somebody has any background at all. It can be a great way to help people become more acquainted with things. Um, then we have become a better enterprise excellence assessor. So there's some opportunities there, April 24th, 25th. We have One Piece Flow Production uh, with um, OC Tanner on April 26th. Then we have uh, Lean Summit. These are one of our regionals, AME Charlotte 2023, May 1st through the 3rd. And last but not least, our annual conference at the AME Cleveland, October 30th through November 2nd in Cleveland. So hope to see you at one of those. I've been a volunteer in AME for over 20 years. I'm not gonna say any more than that. It's just over 20 and um, hope to see somebody there. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Really enjoyed um, having you all. Yeah, thank you everyone for joining Cheryl and I on the webinar today. We hope we, uh, you were able to learn some useful and applicable lessons from it. And that uh, we also hope we'll see you joining um, in, in some of the events that we shared with you from AME and Lean Frontiers. So we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.